weekend. Happy holiday weekend, everybody, and Memorial Day weekend. And just fill your home with worship. Fill your backyard with worship. Make your neighbors wonder what you're up to. What's going on over there? And just say this, I'm desperate. I am desperate for Jesus. I am desperate. Here's the problem. We're in Hosea together. Grab your Bibles. And the problem in the book of Hosea is they're no longer desperate. Things have moved in and taken God's rightful place in their heart. They're not desperate anymore. And maybe you just need to sort of this morning ponder that thought and pray about it in the sense of just acknowledging this is the proper condition of your heart is to be desperate for the Lord. And just to acknowledge that, Lord, I'm desperate. Desperate for more of you. Desperate for a move of you in my marriage. Desperate for you to move in the heart of my kids. Desperate we are to see you move in this nation. We got to be desperate. We got to be a desperate church. That, that ought to be known about us. May that be said of Horizon. They're desperate. We're desperate for the Lord. Desperate for his word. Desperate for revival. And if you're not, uh, you're in a world of hurt. You're like plopped down right, uh, stuck in the pages of Hosea. And, uh, and you ought to pray this morning. This ought to be your prayer. Make me desperate, because I ain't desperate. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're flat, like flatlined. Maybe you're like lukewarm. It's going to take more than Sienna to wake you up. It's going to take more than a good cup of coffee. Did you see that meme that went out that said, I'm sending a second cup down to see why the first cup isn't working. <laughs> so whatever it takes, just say, Lord, make me desperate for you. Because you want to, at all costs, avoid the fruitlessness uh, that is occurring and continuing to happen uh, here in the, in the book of Hosea. Uh, I saw another meme that went out. It's sort of like this funny picture. At least I thought it was funny. This sort of like funny little photo. It looks like this. Finally, a parking spot just for fat guys that barbecue. There's your, there's your Memorial Day. There it is. <laughs> That's hilarious. Come on, 9 o'clock. Huh? That's great. Now, don't be stealing the parking spot for the pregnant gal, but that's funny. Fat guys at barbecue. Okay. Um, then someone sent me a great quote. Here's this like, little nugget of a quote here. Uh, um, go back. We'll get to that one, you guys. Is there one? Thank you. God runs to restore the ones who return to him. Well, that's where we left off. We looked at returning to the Lord last time together, and we spelled return, anyone remember? Repent, R-E-P-E-N-T. Repent is what it means to return. The way you return to the Lord, look at this, God runs. There's the picture of the father who's waiting for his prodigal to return, and God is the dad on the porch that runs to restore the one who returns to him. And, and, and that's his prayer for Israel in the pages of Hosea. You got it? Say, got it? Okay, look at chapter 9. Hosea 9. Hosea 9. Do not rejoice, O Israel, with joy like other peoples. You're like, why? It's holiday weekend. No work tomorrow. For you have played the harlot. And he's, he's really in the, in the best way he can this morning to him. He's sort of, and we get to sort of eavesdrop on this. We get to learn from history on this. Listen, there are lessons in Scripture that the Lord has seen fit to memorialize. This is one of them. I know for a lot of people, Hosea is not like their go-to book. It's more of a flyover. <laughs> like you wrapped up Daniel and you're headed to the New Testament, and Hosea is a flyover. And no one like hunkers down and, and, and sort of like digs in. But if God was to send a prophet to the United States of America today, I'm telling you, 
he would send Hosea. And in the most a genteel of ways, I mean, he could have just sort of like pulled the rug out and dropped the bomb. And he's like, he's like this again. He's like said it about every way you possibly can say it. And now he says it again in chapter nine. He's like this. You know what he's saying? Knock it off. Knock it off. Be, be desperate for me. Don't rejoice with joy like other people for you've played the harlot against your God. That's exactly, that's what he said back in chapter 8. Look at chapter 8. Remember in chapter 8, look at verse 11. Because Ephraim has made many altars for sin. And that's what he's, that's what he's bringing to their attention here in chapter 9. And they're just kind of wanting to laugh it off. Like it's a long weekend. Come on. And he's like, no, no, no. You've played the harlot against your God and you've made love for hire on every, thresh, on every threshing floor. Therefore, this is it, as a result, as a result of verse 1, here you have the consequences in verse 2, the threshing floor and the wine press, which was really their target and their Costco. It's where they'd go to buy their, their goods. It's where you'd get your groceries, you'd go to the threshing floor, you go to the wine press. You go to Home Depot, and you stop by Costco. You go, I ain't going to Costco on a holiday. Okay, I get it. That's why we have in and out for you. in and out here. Hallelujah. Still got the verses on the cups. I think the verses are on the bottom of the French fry thing too, right? Isn't that cool? So cool. So I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, gearing, I'm gearing to quit at, at 20 after. And then... I think that's too early for hamburgers. I might stretch this thing out a little bit. <laughs> I don't really think you're going to be ready for the hamburger until about half past. We'll see how it goes. I don't know. You might just be walking and you're like, at 20 after, I'm going right double, double, man. I'm... He's like, listen, your trip to Target is about to get changed. Your trip to Costco, your, 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 your normal run to Ralph's and Devon's and and, 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 and over to Home Depot, I remember as the Easter service here, and I was like, who names their grocery store Ralph's? That actually means to, th to Ralph means to throw up. Why would you ever name your grocery store? And the Ralph's family was at church that morning. <laughs> like from right over here at four, four like the Ralphs, and they've never come back. Lord, forgive me. I was, I was just like, why would you? Because that's our name, okay, dude? All right, okay. So they're on their way to Target. They're on their way to Home Depot. They're on their way over to Costco. And he's like, verse 2, he's like, I'm shutting it down. I'm shutting it down. Your, your routine's about to change because I'm shutting it down and drying it up. I'm not making it up. Right here, verse 2. The threshing floor and the wine press shall not feed them. And their new wine shall fail. For they shall not dwell in the Lord's, in the Lord's land, but Ephraim will return to Egypt. There's, there, there's a reckoning right there. He's like, you know what, you guys? He, really, he's like, enough. You're going back into the depression. You're going back into recession. You're going back into captivity. You're going back to Egypt. Now I came and I heard your cries and I set you free and I delivered you from Egypt, but you've taken all that for granted and now you've played the harlot against your God and I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to return you by the ball and chain into captivity. You'll no longer dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt and they'll eat unclean things in Assyria. They'll not offer wine offerings to the Lord or sacrifices that are pleasing to him. It'll be like bread of mourners to them. And all who eat of it will be defiled. For their bread shall be for their own life and it'll not come into the house of the Lord. He's, he's like, remember in Ezekiel where Ezekiel sees this picture of the spirit as it's departing from the temple. And it's, it's like from the holy of holies and, and to the door and to the threshold and then up to the ceiling and out it goes. And he's just like mourning because God's gone. And he's like, I don't know how else to get your attention. And, 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 and so verse five, what will you do? 
in the appointed day, in the day of the feast of the Lord. For indeed they have gone because of destruction. Egypt will gather them up. In Memphis, it's just a city in Egypt. It's like the capital of captivity, Memphis is. It's going to bury you. It's going to bury them. And Nettles, another city in Egypt, shall possess their valuables of silver and thorns. You got this verse? Look at verse 6. You got it? Say, got it? Thorns shall be in their tent. That's a bad night's sleep. You got stuff. Oh, ow, what's that? What are you changing the sheets with? Thistles? Thorns? It's like thorns will be in your bed. Thorns will be in your tent. For the days of punishment have come. And I'm, I'm just like, who's, who's, who's desperate? This is gonna, it's like going to wake up say we we gotta get right with god we we gotta return enough of this nonsense i mean our nation's going down and if there was ever a prophet that god would choose to come and wake america up i think it'd be jose it's like the days of punishment have come and the days of recompense recompense have, have come and israel knows prophet's a fool and a spiritual man's insane he's like it's all gone has it not church is this not relevant it is all gone absolutely insane in a short amount of time, like in the last couple of years, up is down and down is up and good is bad and bad is good and, and, and guys are playing girls sports. And condom dispensers, this is why kids aren't in here, we got them in kids' church. Condom dispensers in every woman's prison. Condom dispensers in every woman's prison your tax dollars why because you got you got that many johns and jokers in their transgender lined up to be placed out of the men's jail and into the women's jail it's mixed up he goes it's it's so mixed up prophet's a fool and the spiritual man is insane so I don't know about you, I'm relating with the mayhem in Hosea. It's all gone crazy. It's, just, it's a mess. I feel, I, I, I feel the emotion of the chaos that, that God finds himself confronted with where, where his own special people are concerned. They're a mess. This is wreaking havoc. And yet he's merciful. And again, he starts this chapter by saying, Come on back. Return. Return to the Lord. The order that he wants to bring out of their chaos and, and, and the peace and shalom. They should be living in the peace and shalom of the Lord. And right now, rockets raining down on Tel Aviv. Right now. And a bunch of conspiracies this morning that Israel's allowing it to sort of once again muster national support for the white, and, and you're like, I don't know who to trust in you. I don't know who to believe anymore. And I'm just thankful for scripture. I'd go insane without it. Because so everything else is going insane. And this sets us apart and gives us a light for our journey and a, and a, and a, and a pathway home and a, and, a, and, a, and a marker and a landmark, lest we, like them, tear them all down. Then we've totally lost our way with no hope of groping for the light switch or finding the way home. I mean, it's a mess, and we should be living in the shalom, glory, and mercy of the Lord, and they are, they are getting rocked left and right over and over and over again. They're to be set apart, and they're anything but. So I don't know about you. I'm just so glad we can come into the house of the Lord and be taught truth. We can be given the, the, the promise of Scripture. Look, at you have a God this morning. And I know some of you are like miffed at him, and I'm not sure why. Like, whatever. He's told you what the problem is. He's told you how it's going to go down in the end. He's told you where it's going to go down. He's told you why. He's told you who. He's told you where. He's like, set you, he's giving you, and, and you're like, well, he hasn't told me everything. He hasn't told me when. I want to know when. Trust him. He's given you everything else. He's told you why. He's told you what. He's told you who. He's told you where. I want to know when. You are, geez, I 
knuckle sandwich. Trust him, that's faith. They're like, when, when? You got to tell us when, when? And even the disciples, when? He's like, only my dad knows. Even the angels don't, only dad knows. Here's this God who wants for us to trust him. And the one holdout in your jigsaw puzzle is a little piece that says, when. I just want to know when, I want to know when, I want to know how, how much time I have. Just jump into his arms. Would you run to Calvary, please? Return to the Lord. Because without Christ, there is no remedy for you. You're that broken, and so am I. That's why we're here. And I get it. Not everyone wants to hear it. It's a holiday weekend, man. Lighten up. I know, I know, I know. But for everyone who leaves, there seems to be three showing up saying, would you just tell me the truth? The truth is, you're not stage four. You're like stage 400. And it's incurable what you have apart from Christ. You can't fix yourself. You're like stage 400 in this whole thing that's going down. You're terminal without Jesus. And here he is once again with his arms everlasting arms just wide open, wanting to just welcome you home. And he's like, I don't know what it's going to, maybe maybe I'll I'll just put like some thorns in their mattress and that'll like stir them a bit. Because the days of punishment, verse 7, they've come, the days of recompense. Israel knows. The prophet's a fool. Spiritual man's gone insane because of the greatness of your iniquity and the great enmity. You know what enmity means? It means hatred. The watchman of Ephraim is with my God, but the prophet is a fowler snare in all of his ways. Enmity, what's it mean again? Hatred. Hatred in the house of his God. Why? Verse 9, for they are deeply corrupted, as in the days of Gibeah. As in the days of, circle that, underline that. Give that a little star next to it. And remind me, we'll, 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 you circle it, and then we'll circle back. Because some of you are like, you just lost me. As in the days of Gibeah, what in the world? See, that would have been one of those ancient landmarks. That would have been a Memorial Day monument. That he's wanting them to recollect. To memorialize. They would want, they would, they would, they, they'd be wise to remember. And, and they're like, out of sight, out of mind. No recollect, clueless. Don't even, as in the days of Gibeah, circle that and we'll circle back. As in the days of Gibeah, he'll remember their iniquity and he'll punish their sins. So it was bad. And some of your study Bibles have a little notation next to Gibeah. It's like worst day ever. Probably says that in your margin, like worst day ever. And yet, worst day ever, look at, the ver- look at the next verse. Verse 10 follows verse 9. And following the worst day ever, in the days of Gibeah, I'll remember their iniquity and I'll punish their sins. Verse 10 follows and he says, I found Israel. In other words, while we were still sinners, God chose to love us. Because he's a God of love. Not because we're lovable. Get over yourself. We're not all that lovable. But he's a God of love, so even in our worst day, most sinful state, he found us. You didn't find him, he found you. I found Israel. I found them when they were wild, he says in verse 10. Wild, like grapes in the wilderness. It's growing wild. Saw your father's first fruits on the fig tree in 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 the first season. Remember Jesus curses the fig tree? He's like, wow, that looks good. I'm hungry. I'm going to grab something to eat. And he gets closer to the tree. There's no fruit on it. And he curses it. And the disciples come back later and they're like, wow, look at the tree that you cursed. It is dried up from the root. The fig tree always represents Israel. So again, he's like this. He's like, on your worst day, like in the days of Gibeah, when it was just all out iniquity, I'm I'm up, but I, I found you. I found you in that state. You got a, you're a wild child. 
he got a rebellious streak. And I, 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 I went after you, a little search and rescue mission. And I found you in the wilderness, saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its season. But they, look at, but, it's a big but, I found you, I came after you, you were lost, I came to find, to rescue, but they went to Baal pure. Here's this God, and you just even feel the emotion in the broken heartedness of it all. He's so sad in this chapter. God is. He's like, I found you guys. I came and rescued you, and you chose another God. You chose to worship at Baal, that's another God. Peor, Baal Peor. You might want to circle that. That also would be a stone of remembrance. On Memorial Day weekend, he's like bringing stuff up, up to the surface. He's like, yeah, remember Gibeah? Baal Peor, you know what happened at Baal Peor? That's where, that's where Barak, yeah, different Barak hires Balaam to put a curse on Israel. That was at Baal Peor. And he's all frustrated to the extent now that he's talking to his donkey. And the donkey's talking back. That's at Baal Peor. That's what they chose over running into the everlasting arms of God. Remember Phineas? Phineas is this grandson of Aaron kid, and, and he walks in on this couple doing the nasty, and he's got some Midianite chick in his tent, and, and he runs them through with the javelin. It's like, put that on the chosen. Like, kebab shop, just poo. And, and, and the play... And the plague that had taken out 24,000 of Israel was, was finally lifted. That went down. All that went down at Baal, pure. And he's like this. He's like, I came after you guys. I came to deliver you. I came to save you. I came to rescue you. And you chose, you chose another God. They went to Baal, pure and separated themselves to that shame, it says, to that shame. And then look at this, look at, look at this. I got it, I got this one circled, underlined, starred, and highlighted. Look at my Bible, look at this, look at. They became an abomination like the thing they loved. Do you see that into verse 10? Text that one out. They became, you become like what you love you become like what you worship they became an abomination like the thing they loved what a word from the lord for our day that's like um see the see the race this morning it's like that's a wreck in lap one. That's a red flag. He's like, this isn't working. They, and, and, and they've become, to me, they've become an abomination. Like the thing they, he goes, they could love me. He's like, option, you could love me. No, no, we love ourselves. We're going to love the world. We're going to love Baal pure. We're going to, you're going to be like, the thing that you love that has now taken my place and become, yeah, circle that one. Learn from that one. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. He's like, again, he's like, I am shutting, I'm shutting it down, I'm, I'm, I'm drying it up. And, uh, and they're having kids, but he's like, it isn't gonna. It isn't gonna help. Not gonna be fruitful. No birth. No conception. No pregnancy. No. Though they bring up their children, so now they're having. Verse twelve. They're having. He's like verse eleven. No, they're having kids. Yet I will bereave them to the last man. He says. And then he says this. Yes. Woe to them when I depart from them. 
There, there's your juggernaut right there, guys. That's it, right there. I mean, case solved. Woe to them when, when, when I depart. That's why Moses says, if you're not going with us, do you remember Moses? The, 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 the Lord's had it with them back in the days when he's like, I'm done, I'm out. I tap out, I'm done. Cash in. And Moses is like, if you're not going with us, we're not moving. We're not going without you. Why? Here's why. Woe to them when I depart from them. Just as I saw Ephraim like Tyre planted in a pleasant place, so Ephraim will bring out his children to the murderer. It's like, mur- it's just like lawlessness abounding on every street corner, in every cul-de-sac, in every community of every state across our whole nation. And so Hosea prays this prayer. He- he's like had it too. Like they're just both like up to here with, with how Israel is acting and treating God and, 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 and playing the harlot. And ultimately, Hosea prays this prayer. Look at verse 14. He's like, sick them, God. He's like, give them, O Lord, what you will give. Let them have it, Hosea says. Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. He's like, dry it up. Now listen, here's the point. Because like, there's, there's a, a, a ton of pain in the room where where that particular topic is concerned. So let's apply this to our lives. Because Baal, the God that they've chosen to run after and worship instead of the God of love, of, 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 of Jehovah Almighty, Lord God, Baal is the fertility God. So you see the point. They've become like the God they've chosen to worship instead. And he's like, well, drying it up. And, 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 and because you've gone after fertility gods, I'll, I'll just show you what you're going to get. You ain't getting nothing. It's, it's no, there's never any lasting fruit produced from a life of sin. Did you get that? Because I didn't say that. That was not me. That was the Lord. That was the Lord. That's why you came. There's never. Lasting fruit. Ever. That comes from a life of sin. And they've chosen a life of sin. And so he gives them another example on Memorial Day weekend. Look at verse 15. Their wickedness is in Gilgal. They're like, Gilgal? I'm not a historian, Bob. I have no idea what you're talking about. It's like, Gibeah. Okay. Uh, Circle. We'll circle back. Gilgal. Another. Another signpost. Another memorial stone another remembrance that they have paved over we paved paradise put up a park they've paved over it and he's like remember Gilgal and they're like The wickedness in Gilgal. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm curious. Okay, I'll bite. What, what was the wickedness in Gilgal? Maybe in your margin of your Bible. Again, it would say to you, it would say this, worst day ever. For there I hated them. Wow. This is a God of love. For there I hated them. Because of the evil of their deeds. I, I don't know about you, but for me and my family, love to learn from that so it could be avoided. I don't want him hating on us. There I hated them. Avoid that landmine. Because of the evil in their deeds, I, I will drive them from my house. And I will love them no more. Wow, this is too much. 
I will drive. Be one thing. I, I'll drive them from my. It's like one thing for you to like, you know, scare off some intruders from your house. This is God's house. This is capital M. I will drive them from my house, and I will love them no more. Wow, what's going on? Well, all of these would have been altars, and all of these altars are being altered, and they don't even remember what these altars were. They have altered the altars. And, and, and they're like, Gilgal? Who in the world? Who, who, do you, who, do you, who in San Diego would even know what Gilgal? Who, who in America? And he's like, that's, that's where I hated him. That's where I locked the door and loved them no more. All their princes are rebellious. Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up and they'll bear no fruit. Yes, were they to bear children, I'd kill the darlings of the... And you're like, oh. What's the cause of all this? Next verse. Glad you asked. Verse 17. My God will cast them away because... Because why? Would you say it with me? Because... They did not obey him. And they become wanderers among the nations as a result. And so, let's go back to that, that Tozer quote, because it says this. Uh, one compromise here and another one there, and soon enough, the so-called Christian and the man of the world look the same. And that's how Tozer would sum up the, ch the ninth chapter of Hosea. Just a little here and a little there. It says in Proverbs, just a little here and just a little there. What's the big deal? The big deal is you're one degree off in your departure from L.A. You're one degree off, you'll never hit Maui. You'll miss the island altogether. Oh, it's just one degree. What's one degree? What's one degree? One compromise. One here and another there. And soon enough, the so-called people of God are playing the harlot and living like everybody else. Every other schmo in town. Just like, what? No. And so this chapter is like a storm tracker. It's, it's like we're watching on the news all week. You're, 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 you're like, what? You got friends in Houston? I do. And you're like, hunker down, hunker down. And it's coming Houston's way. And it wipes Houston out. And you got friends in Iowa? And you're like, Duck, Iowa, right? I mean, you see this one coming? And you're like, get to the cellar, kids, right? You see that one coming out your window? Hosea 9 is that outside of Israel's window. It's the Lord. Washington didn't call in the shots. And neither is Hong Kong, and neither is Moscow. Heaven's calling the shots. You see this one out your window? You got to start tracking the storm. Because this is the storm of unfaithfulness. And if this was your house, <laughs> you'd be like, honey, grab the kid, right? You like this thing over here? And you're watching a twister like that sweep through Iowa. And, 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 and left in its track is a town that now looks like this. There it is. And you see the house it doesn't hit. That's what he says. He says the storms are going to come. Storms are going to come and storms are going to go. Okay? One out of four pregnancies is a miscarriage. So everyone's relating to that passage in some form or another. The question is, which God are you worshiping in the midst of your storm? Storms are going to, it's not, it's not like he's saying to the believer, you're not going to have storms in your life. He's like, and you're going to be able to withstand the storms in your life because you're not worshiping Baal, fertility God, or Molech, the God of money and sex and condom dispensers and women's prison makes no sense. I know the whole world's gone insane and the only thing that keeps me from going insane is the word of God. And we're tracking storms. And this is a storm now of their unfaithfulness. That's why in every wedding I've ever done, and I've done hundreds, they pledge their fidelity to each other. It's like, I will and I do. 
setting all others aside, I'll be faithful to you so long as I both shall live. And if you're faithful, you can weather any storm. But the moment you're not faithful, the moment that goes out the window, man, your whole foundation, everything has been ripped out from underneath you. Until we're separated by death. As God is my witness, I give you my promise and pledge you my love. Everyone says that in the wedding. And yet, we're tracking storms because of the unfaithfulness in the heart of men. We've forgotten Semper Fi. I mean, of all weekends for us to declare Semper Fidelis, bless these guys and gals that have served for our country and blessed us with the freedom that we enjoy. But it's not just the motto of the Marines. It's the motto of your marriage. You've got to be faithful. Always faithful. Quit giving it just to the Marine. I love the Marines. I love when they call me and say, would you pray for us? We're deploying. And, and, the, and, and the whole family's there. Wives and husbands and, and, and sons and daughters and dogs. Pets. And every, just everyone's getting prayed over. There's no atheists on that day. And they're like, it's, it's, it's one thing to remember the men who have served. One thing to remember them on a weekend such as this, but to forgot why they served? As our nation seems to have forgotten. Why? Why? What was, and, 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 and it's because faithfulness has gone out the window. Always faithful. Semper Fi. Hoorah the motto of your marriage it's the motto of this church it's the motto of ministry and the moment you lose sight of the motto you're in the mess of Hosea and look at his marriage Hosea's marriage is equivalent to the condition of the nation look at chapter 10 Israel empties his vine brings forth fruit for himself there's the problem not living for God not faithful to him they're faithful to one and one only themselves Faithful to the God they see staring back at them when they look in the mirror. It's the problem. It's the problem then, it's the problem now. And and, and they've emptied the vine. Why? Because they're worshiping themselves. He brings forth fruit for himself, just all about himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he's increased the altar. See, they've altered the altars. And now they've constructed a new altar to the worship of oneself. Just the worship of self, according to the bounty of his land. They've embellished his sacred pillars. They've embellished his sacred pillars. Their heart is divided. And they're held guilty. And he'll break down their altars. And he'll ruin their sacred pillars. For now they say, we have no king. Because we did not fear the Lord. And as for a king, what would he do for us? And they, like Pilate, have washed their hands of the need of this whole thing spoken words and swearing falsely and making a covenant this this judgment then springs up like hemlock in the furrows of the field it's just like weeds growing like weeds. you don't have to plant weeds weeds just grow on their own and he's like this is weeds out of control and it's literally according to the parable of the sower what chokes out the seed of god's truth in the soil of your heart is this weed problem we need like raid and roundup and he's like it's just out of control it's growing like hemlock in the furrows of the field and the inhabitants of samaria fear because the calf of beth avon its people mourn for it and its priests shriek for it because its glory is departed from it remember that ichabod the glory of the lord just like old ezekiel when he watches that he just watches that that the whole thing go down. It was in the Holy of Holies, and then it goes, goes to the threshold, and then it goes to the sea, and then it's gone. It's, it's like Ichabod just departs. And he's like this. He's like, gone. Gone. The idol, verse 6 to be carried to Assyria as a present for King Jerob. Ephraim shall receive shame and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. Samaria, her king, is cut off like a twig on the water in the high places of Avon for the sin of Israel. Know this. Look at this. Circle this. This is verse 8. 
star it, circle it, memorialize it. Don't forget this. The sin of Israel will be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle, remember that? Stuck it in the mattress, was in the tent. It's a hard night's sleep. It's been a hard. The thorn and the thistle shall grow on their altars. It just starts growing up on their, and, and, and they shall say to the mountains, cover us. They'll say to the hills, fall on us. Okay, there's two times in scripture where this promise from Hosea chapter 10 gets repeated. One time by Jesus, you know when he says it? He, of all places, he says it while he's carrying the cross on the Via Della Rosa. And the women are all wailing. The women are all wailing, they're crying, and, he, and he's, like, he's, he's like, cry for yourselves. He's carrying his cross to the hill of Calvary. And these women are bawling, they're wailing, they're crying, they're, they've, they've, they've lost control, they're filled with emotion, and he's like, cry for yourselves. He like stops the parade long enough to say to them, if you think they're doing this to me while the branch is green, imagine what they're going to do to the branch when it's dried up. And, 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 and brings to mind the very fact that in that day they will cry to the mountains and wish for them to fall on their heads. The other time that is mentioned is in Revelation chapter 6. In the middle of the, of, the, of the great tribulation going down, people on earth will beg that the mountains would fall on us and they wish they had never been born. How fascinating. Both instances quote from Hosea that they will cry to the mountains, cover us, they'll cry to the hills, fall on us. Oh, Israel, you have sinned from the days of Gibeah. You're like, what, really? I thought that was in chapter 9. Yeah, you circled it in chapter 9, verse 9, and it shows up again in chapter 10, verse 9. Gibeah, a monument on Memorial Day weekend that is meant to trigger something in them, to, to recall something in them that's gotten long over buried and, 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 and grown over with weeds and with hemlock branches. And he's like, you've sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood, the battle of, the battle of Gibeah against the children of iniquity. It didn't overtake them. It's like worst day ever. Worst day ever, when it was my desire, I will chasten them, people shall be gathered against them, and I will bind them for their two transgressions. You're like, what are the two? It would be, it would be, it would be this, Israel and, and Judah. It would be a nation now divided into two kingdoms that are now consistently reminiscent of two sins. He's like, he's like Gibeah and Gilgal. And I'll, I'll, I'll package that and bind it together. Ephraim, another word for Israel, is the trained heifer that loves to thresh grain, but I'm going to harness her fair neck. Like back into captivity you're going. Bound, burdened, ball and chain. I'll harness her fair neck and I'll make Ephraim pull a plow. And Judah, Judah shall plow. And Jacob will break its clods. It's just like a picture of, of, of a time meant to be memorialized so that we'd learn from it so that we'd make right choices going forward. I read about a bank executive in the 1900s that he looked out his window at the bank, he had some customers with him in the office, and he commented to the customers about all the, the, the bikers that were biking up and down the boulevard, and he, he noted this, he said, he said to the customers, looking out the window of his bank office, he said, there are less bikers this month than last month. This fad is wearing off he says. And then he says this to his customers that we're looking to invest. He said, don't buy automobile stock. It's going 
automobile, this was in the 19th, he said, automobile stock will, will be a fad just like the bicycle. The horse and buggy are here to stay, literally he says to them. Now I get it, we don't know everything about what's going to happen, but he's given you enough and told you who's involved and why they're involved and where it's going to go down and what it's all about. And you're like, you're like I just need to know when. And, 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 and here, the, the, the bank executive chose foolishly and said, don't buy automobile stock. You'll lose everything you put into it for it's just a fad. It's very reminiscent to what the president of DACA Recording Company said in 1962. You know what he said? The Beatles' sound won't last. Guitar music is on its way out. That's what he said. Sounds like Ken Olson, the chairman of Digital Equipment Company in 1977. You know what he said? People will never want computers in their homes. Now listen, you have a gracious, merciful, loving God and Heavenly Father right now this morning that's giving you the heads up so that right choices could be made moving forward. Because what clearly is being outlined for us to learn from in these two chapters, Hosea 9 and 10, is a world that's lost its way. Sum it up with me. Here's the list. There, 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 any good kings? M-I-A. None. None. None in Israel. Not a single good king in Israel. Good kings, missing in action. Violence, on every street corner. No surprise. Jesus told you it would be like this in the end. He said, in the end, lawlessness will abound, and the love of many will wax cold. Violence, compromise, corruption, no knowledge. A lot of information. You can Google anything. You don't even have to tap it in with your fingers. You just say, hey, Google. Huge difference between information and knowledge. He's like, here's the problem. Quoting Hosea, there's no knowledge of me. There's no knowledge of God. The knowledge consumption of the world is at an all-time record high, but not of God. No knowledge of God. Get your kids to Horizon Prep. Stephen has chosen to lift anyone over the construction fence and hold you there so you can get a little glimpse of what we're building now. Because everything else has fallen apart and leadership is a farce. What a joke it's become, the courtrooms of our nation. Courtrooms are a joke, lawlessness abounds, and we're headed into Pride Month. Buckle up. It's like they are literally driving off the cliff into the darkest hour in the history of Israel. Johannes Hurdle, here's a quote, Johannes Hurdle said the most amazing thing. He said, if the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, which it is a number of times according to the book of Proverbs, Johannes, Johannes, Johannes Hurdle, If the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, then to lose sight of God is the beginning of delusion. Thus, the list that we just reviewed, to which God would then call Hosea when Israel is at its lowest rung on the ladder, like rock meat bottom. And I'm telling you, my money is on, you want to pick a prophet that God would choose to reach America, because this seems to be such a fitting study, and I take no credit for it. You can't be looking at me this morning saying, Bob, you were spot on with the timing of this one. This is the Lord orchestrating the book that he wants open on your lap and mine. Because if you were to compare America with Israel, Look at the fascinating things that these two nations have in common, Israel and America. And that slide chosen because both seem to be cracking at their foundation and coming undone at the seams. 
Think of the favorable start that both of these nations receive. The intrigue of that is most interesting. The blessing of the Lord, both on Israel and on America, the sweetness and beauty in the inception of their glorious beginning and miraculous start. And then somehow both nations get stalled, sad to say, spiritually stalled. And if they don't get back on track, the end will be a train wreck. And that's why it's not just an Old Testament thing. It's, it's, and I'm into the Old Testament. I mean, I, I, I really relate with the mayhem of the Old Testament. And, and the, 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 the God of the universe just mercifully continues to want to gather them back, to call them, to call them home. It's happening now. It's happening here. It's why Paul writes the book of Galatians. He calls them out. He's like, oh, foolish Galatians. It wasn't a typo. He says it twice. He goes, lest you missed it in chapter 1, let me repeat myself in chapter 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, having begun in the Spirit, as both of these nations did. You think you're going to be completed in the flesh? Like building altars for yourself? For when we fail to learn from history, that actually becomes our destiny. And so, Gilgal and Gibeah. Gilgal and Gibeah. Gilgal repeatedly brought to their attention in these chapters. Why? Gilgal was the first camp once they entered into the promised land. Where they first camped out was Gilgal. That's fascinating. You're like, I thought it was Jericho. Jericho was the first battle of victory that God blessed them with. All they did was walk around silently, didn't say a word until the seventh day. Gives them, hands them the gift of Jericho. But where they were camped? Gilgal. In fact, when they took the memorial stones on Memorial Day weekend, when they took the stones out of the Jordan River, when, when they collected 12 of the stones, they compiled a, 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 a monument, a memorial in Gilgal where they celebrated the Passover for the first time in the Promised Land. That's why he brings it up, because they've forgotten all of this. They've, they've altered their textbooks. They've changed their own history. They've forgotten about the memorial stones. They've forgotten about the camp of Israel. They've forgotten that's the first place that they ever celebrated Passover. Oh, they had celebrated it in the wilderness, and they'd celebrated it in Egypt, but now entering into the promised land, the first place Passover is celebrated is in Gilgal. You would think, wouldn't you think? Yeah, they have no recollection. They don't remember any of it. And so he's bringing it to their Memorial Day weekend. He's like, God, don't forget Gilgal. You've forgotten Gilgal. That's where Elijah's from. Elijah, hometown Gilgal. In fact, Gilgal is where Saul was crowned king. You're like, well, this is all good, but those two chapters we just studied together on this wonderful holiday weekend wasn't all that good. Because Gilgal is also where Saul lost his kingdom because he made it all about himself. Gilgal becomes the capital of trusting in oneself. Gilgal is changed. It is reformed. It, it is the, 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 the old representation of the Passover and the memorial stones and, 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 and the birthplace of, 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 of Elijah, of all people, it's just like, now becomes the place where Saul loses his kingdom and becomes sort of the memorial of of self-independence day. We're on our own. We don't need you. And, 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 And Gibeah the same. Most notorious for Gibeah, I won't even remind you of. You're like, 
you remember, and he chops her up into 12 pieces, and a piece goes to each tribe. That happened in Gibeah. And he's like, you don't remember? He's like, worst day ever. In fact, Gibeah was Saul's hometown. It's known throughout Scripture as the Gibeah of Saul, of, 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 of self-rule. Of, of trusting in oneself, of independence from God. Don't need you anymore. Outgrown our need for you. This becomes Gibeah. Gibeah literally in Hebrew means on the hill. This has become the hill. The altar has been altered, and now it is, it is all about us. And, and, and literally, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant that was stolen by the Philistines, which is all that Palestine means, the Philistines. That's all it means. So when your kids are chanting on their $90,000 a year tuition university campus, we are Hamas, free Palestine, they are lining up in like form and spirit with the Philistines who stole the Ark of the Covenant from Israel. And David's like, we got to get that back. That represents the presence of our God. That represents power. That represents promise. That represents and reminds us that it isn't about us, it's about him. And they go to steal it back from the Philistines, and it makes it as far as Gibeah to the front yard of a guy named Abinadab, where it rests for 20 years. Like Noah had an ark in his front yard, and Abinadab had an ark in his front yard. And there was no power, no promise, no blessing in all the nation except for the home of Abinadab. And David's like, get that ark home. And he goes down to get it, and his wife goes, she's like embarrassed, humiliated, because he strips down to the, he's just like, what? He's like, you don't, you haven't even begun to see how I'm going to sing and praise the Lord. And he goes to Gibeah and, 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 and brings the ark back that is sitting on the hill. Gibeah means on the hill in the yard of Abinadab. He goes down in Gibeah, and he's like, I, I'm, I'm just wanting you to recall and remember these landmarks that are meant for you and I to keep us on track, to keep us on course, to keep us in sync with the Spirit, lest the landmarks get lost or even worse, redefined. It becomes a depravity when, when we forget. That's why the Lord's always saying throughout Scripture, remember, 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 remember. Every time you take this bread, every time you drink this cup, remember, 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 remember. All the women in Scripture, Jesus tells you to remember one of them above all the women in Scripture. There's a lot of women in Scripture. He says, remember Lot's wife. We're to remember these things. We're not to repeat these things. They've been memorialized so we would learn from them, so we would turn from trusting in ourselves and allowing the altar to be altered so that now life is all about us and our hearts become rogue and hard and depraved just like theirs. And, and, you're, and you're like, there, there, there must be a better plan. There is, verse 12. Look at the course correction that comes along in verse 12 of chapter 10. Okay, it's 20 after your need for a burger is starting to kick in. We'll close with this. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. He's like, he's like, come on, come on back, come on back. Return, return, come back to me. Stop building for yourself. Sow righteousness. And you'll reap in mercy. Break up the fallow ground. You know what that's saying? It's saying exactly what Sienna just sang. What a gift she is to our church. She's like singing this. She's like, I'm desperate. Desperate for you. Break up the fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord until he comes and rains righteousness on you. This is a message for America. This is a message for our church. This is a message for San Diego. This is a message for your marriage, and it's not just the motto of the Marines. You be faithful. Finish well. Be strong and, and, and courageous and sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up the ground that has grown hard has become unproductive. 
It's time to seek the Lord. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness horizon. Until he comes and rains righteousness on you. Because the alternative to a reign of righteousness, the alternative, it isn't water. For you have plowed wickedness and you have reaped iniquity. You've eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in yourself. You trusted in your own way. He's like, course correction, Memorial Day weekend 2024. Come back to me. And don't procrastinate this. Don't, don't put it off. Saw a great definition for procrastination. Here it is. Working tomorrow for a better today. Isn't that, isn't that wild? Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Working tomorrow for a better today. He's like, don't, don't put this, don't put this off. Run to Calvary. Grab your kids. Grab your wife. Grab your husband and run to the refuge that is found at the foot of the cross. When I was in London, I was introduced to this theologian that I had never read before named Duncan Campbell from Scotland. And what a wise old sage he was that Nicky Gumbel introduced me to. And, and Duncan Campbell said this. Look what he says. Let us be honest in the presence of God and get right into the grips of reality. So my prayer for you. Church, this is my fervent prayer for you this morning. Become desperate for this. Let's get real with God, he's saying. He's saying this all the way back in, in a previous lifetime. He's like, let's get right into the grips of reality. Have I a vision of our desperate need? You're like, hey, that's what Sienna's saying. I know, it's just all being orchestrated by the Lord. Here's what Duncan Campbell says. Oh, for a baptism of honesty. Have you ever prayed that? Just, like, Lord, baptize me in honesty. I just want to be real with you. I want to be desperate for you. For a gripping sincerity that will move us. Like, what's it going to take to move us back to being closer with God, back in step? Is it going to be a burr under your saddle? Is it going to be some weeds? Is it going to be some, some thistles in your mattress? He's, doing all, he's going to all sorts of lengths here to, 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 to rile a response from this. He's like, that will move us. And, th and then he says this. Look at this. The problem is we seem incapable of recognizing how destitute we've become. We're not desperate. We're not Semper Fi. We're living a life of infidelity, of disloyalty, of treachery, of, 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 of Mosaic sings it in one of their songs. They, 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 they say, all of my duplicity. I'll be honest, I had to look it up. Unfaithfulness. All of our All, all of our leaning to our own understanding and, 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 and all of our making peace with our pet sins. We've deemed ourselves rich and in need of nothing, all while piddling piously with ideas of revival. And then old Duncan Campbell says, revival can never be piddled with. Isn't that fascinating that that's what's become of our nation? We're all about us and we're all about self. And we'll piddle with the things of the Lord. We'll just like piddle with revival. We'll just piddle with that. Just piddle with that. He's like, that needs turned on its ear. That everything that we live for that gets us up in the morning is glorifying to God. It's not to be piddled with. And then he said the most amazing thing, and I leave you with this. Duncan says, if the cry of our day 
if the cry of our day is, where is the Lord of Elijah? Better for us to ask, where, dear friends? Where are the Elijahs? Shall we stand and shall we pray? Lord, would your spirit fall upon us? Gracious Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit. Make us into something we've never been. Fill us with gifts of the Spirit that we've never had. Baptize us in the truth of your word that we put all of our weight on it. We trust it with all that we've got and we, we, we wouldn't piddle with revival. We'd, 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 we'd long for it. We'd pray for it. We'd become desperate for it. Lord, for you to move again as you have in times past, as you worked in the days of Luther and brought a reformation. As you worked in the hearts of the Puritans that obeyed your word, the reckless abandonment in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. Lord, may your spirit fall on wives and moms and husbands and dads and sons and daughters in this generation. May we rise to the occasion to be your light and to be your salt world is going to pot and everything seems to have gone insane. Would your spirit come as it has in the days of past through the driest of preachers, the driest of preachers like like Jonathan Edwards and yet through the driest you sparked a revival that swept across the UK transformed through Charles Finney, the coal mines of Wales, swept across Europe, reaching China's underground church and across the oceans and came to this country, swept into the colonies and the states of which this nation was founded. So may the cry of our hearts not be, where is the God of Elijah, where are the people of God? Where are the ones called to stand? Be strong, courageous, faithful, and desperate for you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we hunger this weekend for a move of your spirit. So hear the cries of your people. And may worship fill our homes and our hearts and spill over into our neighbor's backyard both today and tomorrow. May it sweep down our streets and change our nation and bring us back to a God of gracious compassion and mercy and love. Make us desperate for you now more than we've ever been for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray.